6,659 feet in the Appalachian Mountains from the rolling hills of West Virginia and from 230 feet from our affiliate station in Connecticut. This is In Dark Places. I'm Jim Bug Fugant. And hey, check it out. This is episode 100. We made it. When I was trying to figure out how to set up the podcast and everything, I was reading all these forum questions and junk like that. And the consensus seemed to be to race to 100 episodes as fast as you possibly can. Because, I don't know, something magical was supposed to happen or something if you would reach 100 episodes. I don't know what that was. More listeners or maybe unlimited supplies of moon pies. I don't know. But this is 100, so we're going to figure it out. We have listeners from all around the world, and it's kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. But we appreciate all of our listeners, and we just want to give you a heads up. Chances are, China is spying on you right now. The United States shot down the spy balloon after it had enough time to gather all the information it needed about the entire country when it was on its way back to China. We shot it down, and there's like 12 other ones floating around right now over other countries. So yeah, you're being spied on. Chief, may I have a riddle for you? What has big round shape, carries man and dog, and flies? May give up. What has big round shape, carries man and dog, and flies? May not know either, but there it is. <laughs> it is balloon! There's no such thing as balloon. That's what you tell old Rock and Aegon. Must be evil spirit. Well, not just stand there. Sound evil spirit alarm. <laughs> you know how the mainstream media always finds a topic and they just beat it into the ground and continuously cover it over and over for weeks or months? Kind of like the COVID thing. It started some had a weird new trend or something. I don't know have tons of coverage of every little story that comes out of the news now so I think I'm gonna steal a play out of their book I have some more insight into the egg story I've got this friend who will call L for purposes of keeping him anonymous L is the guy that told me about his father-in-law seeing the pair of red eyes along the fence line a few houses past mine so he's a reliable source that's what I'm getting at L doesn't make up these kind of stories so L was sitting out in his car on lunch a couple of days before recording this which I guess would have been February 4th or something like that he was sitting in his car eating lunch and this truck pulled up and parked next to him and L couldn't help but notice that the truck had an egg carton sitting on his dashboard. He kind of glanced over at the guy and he was just staring back at him intently with the egg carton in between them. And L said he waited there a couple minutes and then suddenly another car pulled in, parked over kind of across from both of them. The guy got out of his car and he had a carton of eggs as well and he got into the car with the other guy who had the egg carton sitting on his dashboard and they sat there in the guy's car talking for a while and their eggs were with them so we're trying to figure out what was going on there I don't know if it was kind of a drug deal and they were trading with eggs or what the deal was but the egg story yeah it never goes away And the new conspiracy of the day is that egg yolks are now found to be a cure for COVID. So that's why there's a sudden egg shortage because the government is hijacking all the eggs because they don't want people having this kind of knowledge that they should eat tons of egg yolks. You know, because they want to keep everybody sick and stuff, I guess. We talk a lot about little weird synchronicities and premonitions and stuff like that on the show 
So I had maybe a uh, synchronistic premonition on February 5th while I was at work. I was going out to my car while I was on my break, as I tend to do, to kind of get away from all the weird people. I noticed this red GMC truck. It was parked across from mine. And it was kind of trimmed with black around the fenders and stuff. And as I was walking toward it, I didn't really get a good look at it. It was getting kind of dark out and stuff. And I saw that black trim around the fenders. And I was thinking, oh, dude, I feel your pain. Your truck's rusting out just like mine is. And then upon closer examination, I saw that it was just like a black final thing around the fenders. So I didn't really think much of it. I went back into work and everything. And then a couple of hours later when I got off work, I was walking out to my car so I could leave. And there was a different red GMC Sierra truck parked in that same spot. And this truck did have rust around its fenders and around the bottom of its doors and stuff. So it was kind of weird because I thought that the other truck had rust and it wasn't. And then there was a, another truck the same color and everything same make and it did have the rust a few hours later so maybe synchronicity i don't know and now here is mr haunted with this week's top 10 list hello individuals in dark places listeners this is mr haunted with a psa This is a Reader's Digest list of the 10 most annoying phrases. And this episode is sponsored by Reader's Digest, a trusted friend in a complicated world. I will start with the 10th most annoying phrase, and then we'll go up to number one. I know, right? This phrase is a catch-all answer from everything from It's so hot out today. I know, right? Two, I'm so happy that meeting went well. I know, right? Of course, the other person knows. They said it to begin with. Holy mackles. Instead, try following up with some meaningful conversation instead of this bland blanket statement that makes you sound like a teenager. Number nine on the list. Totes. Totes is the shortened version of totally. Another equally annoying word in its own right. But totes takes it to another extreme and makes you sound immature, sliding text messages speak into your everyday language. Instead, please just stop. Erase this one from your lexicon immediately. I've also heard totes my goats. I like that one. YOLO. You only live once is mostly an excuse for doing something selfish, irresponsible, or dumb, but the act itself should be transgression enough. Don't punish your friends with this insufferable abbreviation. On top of it, instead, before you speak or act a fool, Remember, Yodo, too. I don't know what that means. YOLO! Number seven on the list. I personally, as opposed to I collectively, your redundant adverb just stole an extra second of life from everyone in the room. How do you personally feel about that? Instead, just say I or wear a t-shirt that says disclaimer the views expressed by this doofus do not reflect the views of society at large number six on the list just saying how illuminating thank you for clarifying that the thing you just said is a thing you just said instead show an ounce of empathy and ask Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Number five on the list. At this moment in time. What are you, freaking Whitney Houston? Okay. At at this moment in time, 
I deserve a raise, you say. Not at this moment in time, the boss replies. What an oddly philosophical way to murder someone's dreams. It reminds us of that old business... I don't... K-O-A-N? Cone? I don't know that word. Let's freaking say that's an annoying word. What is the sound of one redundant employee crying? Instead, be honest. Rip off that bandage in one swift motion. I'm sorry, but that is never going to happen. Number four on the list. With all due respect. Almost always coupled with an insult or unsolicited advice, this phrase is a smarmier way to say, prepare to be disrespected. Examples include, with all due respect, you're fired. Instead, eliminate the preamble if you're just going to say something that others might find offensive. Just say it or keep quiet. Number three, at the end of the day, this perspective-seeking cliché sounds even worse than cousins all in all and when push comes to shove, particularly because it's used at all hours of the day. You're probably listening to this at all hours of the day. So instead, say, ultimately, and you'll sound more like a classy Bond villain instead of a 19th century factory worker. Oh, this one. This one's used a lot lately, I noticed. It is what it is. This desperate filler phrase is a longer version of whatever, and a shorter version of I have nothing helpful to contribute, but don't want to stop talking yet. Instead, Memorialize this clever-sounding T.S. Eliot line. If you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? Okay, I'd rather hear it is what it is than that stupid line right there. And the number one most annoying phrase in the English language, according to the Reader's Digest, a trusted friend in a complicated world, is thanks in advance. This demeaning management phrase, often accompanying some unwanted assignment, is the polite corporate way of saying, you would better do this terrible thing or you don't get a paycheck. Instead, cut to the chase with, I know you don't want to do this in advance. So that's the 10 most annoying phrases in the English language. And you know what? At the end of the day, you just gotta say YOLO. Now, back to more In Dark Places. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jimmy. I hate all of those phrases, I think. I just want to smack some of those people whenever they use those. I've already discussed my dislike of the word literally. I literally hate that one. I guess it's not really a phrase, but, you know, it's still annoying. People talk about, I was literally sitting there, and I was literally cracking up, and just crazy stuff like that. Why do they have to use the word literally so much? There used to be this girl that worked with me. She was kind of over in the seafood side, and any time she needed us to cut any kind of steaks for her, she would say, please and thank you. She would come over and she would say, Will you cut six ribeyes for me, please, and thank you? That was pretty annoying. I didn't like that. And now here is your Nicolas Cage, y'all down of the week. Look, if, if you're scared, I get it. It's okay. But I'm not. And, and I've, I've come this far. So please open the door. You'll get his kill. I'm, I'm gonna ask you one more time. Please open it. I can't. Open it! Open it! Jim. 
Open it! 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 British military aircraft reports very close encounter with donut shaped UFO by Tim Banal. <laughs> Aviation authorities in England have released a report on a curious case wherein a Royal Air Force jet nearly collided with a donut shaped UFO. The odd incident, which was revealed by a local media outlet, thanks, local media outlet this past Saturday is said to have occurred last November over the city of Newcastle during a training exercise involving a military transport plane. As their flight was making a turn crew members noticed what they thought was a drone flying overhead the aircraft. However, when they passed the odd object the personnel aboard the jet were left mystified by what they saw. According to the UK Air Prox Board, which investigates such aerial incidents, the mysterious object passed level with the flight deck windows and a few feet outside the wingtip. This vantage point allowed the crew to get a fairly good look at the anomaly. They described it as a dark circular object measuring two or three feet in diameter with a hole in its center. Although they characterized the object as a drone in their report, the board conceded that the peculiar shape of the craft left them unable to determine the nature of the unknown object. The report went on to note that while they could not identify exactly what the object was, the case was particularly troublesome as the two craft only passed within about a foot of each other. To that end, they mused that Providence had played a major part in the incident, as there was a very high chance that the jet would have collided with the UFO had it not been turning at the very moment that the sighting took place. Fortunately, that did not occur, and instead the crew aboard the aircraft were simply left with a particularly strange tale from that day's flight. Thanks, Tim Banal. It is balloon! Mom gives birth to giant baby measuring two feet tall and weighing a whopping 16 pounds. Little Angerson Santos was born via C-section, I should hope so, in Brazil on Wednesday and is believed to be the biggest baby born in the state of Amazonas, weighing a massive 16 pounds and measuring a towering two feet tall. Medics believe that the supersized baby is the biggest to have ever been born in the state, beating the previous record of 13 pounds and 1.8 feet. His mom, what a champ, 27-year-old Claudine Santos dos Santos, had visited the hospital for a routine obstetric consultation. But doctors quickly realized that the unborn child would be too big for her to carry to full term. He would have gotten bigger, so kept her in for a C-section. Surgeons carried out the C-section the next day, and Angerson was born weighing 7.32 kilograms and measuring 59 centimeters. The not-so-little baby is in an incubator, but is in stable condition and has no abnormalities, according to medics at the hospital. Angerson is so big that all the baby clothes his parents had bought him don't fit. So the hospital has launched a fundraiser to help the family out. Wah! His clothes are too small. Wah! The facility is taking donations of extra large nappies and clothes for babies aged between nine months and a year. You know, this kid right here, <laughs> they already started him out on the wrong foot. Because when he's being a little jerk in uh, school, they're going to say, you're being a big baby. And he was. <laughs> Loose cow in California breaks windshield. Poops on Tesla. By Ben Hooper. Thanks, Ben. Police in California wrangled a loose bovine 
that managed to shatter a windshield and leave an unsavory mess in a collision ah, 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 with a Tesla. The Pleasanton Police Department said in a Facebook post that officers responded late Wednesday night about a loose cow wandering into traffic alone. Burnell and Stanley officers arrived to find the brown cow running around the area. They determined the animal had been in a cow collision. <laughs> Again, wow. This guy's great. With a sedan that shattered the vehicle's windshield and left its hood covered in what appears to be feces. The cow was not injured and was safely returned to its owner with some help from local ranchers, police said. See so, y'all. Uh, even cows know that Tesla's ain't gonna work. It is balloon! The story's out of Boston. Box Center Wang Theater facing harsh criticism over botched handling of busted sprinkler pipes that left guests in 10 degrees for over an hour. At around 1,700 hours tonight, Saturday, February 4th, Boston firefighters were called to the Box Center, Wang Theater, and Boston to investigate an alarm stemming from an issue with the sprinkler system. During the incident, many people who had already entered the theater were forced to evacuate onto the street. All upcoming shows tonight were canceled. The cause of the alarm was soon found out to be a burst sprinkler pipe, which had set off the alarm. Despite firefighters quickly locating the source, fans remained outside left in a bitter cold with no information. The situation quickly took a turn for the worse as guests found themselves waiting outside in freezing temperatures for over an hour with no explanation or updates from the theater staff. Guests could be heard chanting, let us in, let us in, in front of the theater. Many guests took to social media to voice their frustration and disappointment with many calling for better emergency protocols and improved communication from the theater. In a tweet, one showgoer said, uh, An hour in the freezing cold with no explanation. My family and I have to leave. We can't take these temperatures. Another Twitter user criticized the establishment by saying, Poor handling from the wing. Lovey, uh, we're trying to uh, enjoy our theater experience. And it's much too cold. And we're stuck outside. Wah! A bunch of babies. Did Earth's inner core stop spinning? New study finds it may soon start turning in reverse. By Natalie Nasa Alund. Thanks, Natalie. Planet Earth's inner core may have stopped turning and could go into reverse, according to a study published this week, which was last week, I guess, because it's kind of an old story. Earth is formed of three layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core. Made almost entirely of metal, specifically iron and nickel, its inner core rests 3,200 miles below the crust, separated from the mantle by a liquid outer core which allows the inner core to rotate at a different speed from the planet's rotation. Researchers studied seismic waves from repeating earthquakes that have passed through the Earth's inner core over the last six decades to infer how fast the inner core is spinning. Zoladong Song and Yi Yang of China's Peking University published Monday in the journal the study's authors said they found that the inner core's rotation came to a near halt around 2009 and then turned in an opposite direction. Since then, the authors said seismic records, which previously changed over time, showed little difference. This globally consistent pattern suggests that the inner core rotation has recently paused, they wrote. 
we show surprising observations that indicate the inner core has nearly ceased its rotation in the recent decade and may be experiencing a turning back. When you look at the decade between 1980 and 1990, Song said, you see clearer change, but when you look at 2010 through 2020, you don't see much change. What effect does the inner core have on people? There is little to indicate. The inner core's rotation has much effect on humans, but both researchers said that they believe there are physical links between all Earth's layers from the inner core to the surface. We hope our study can motivate some researchers to build and test models which treat the whole Earth as an integrated dynamic system, they wrote. <laughs> See, yeah, that's got good news written all over it. wonder what kind of distraction the mainstream media will try to put over top of that one to try to cover it up. Nothing to see here. That's probably climate change. Maybe the Mercury retrograde. Who knows? It is balloon! 1,000 pound sister star Tammy Slayton's Kentucky house robbed while she was away at weight loss rehab. Thieves took advantage of 1,000 pound sister star Tammy Slayton being away in weight loss rehab to break into her Dixon, Kentucky house to steal her furniture. It's probably broken anyway. The burglars kicked down the back door to the house and also made off with Tammy's washer and dryer, Webster County Deputy Starkey told The Sun in May 2022. Now, the aftermath will be seen on the February 7th, 2023 episode of the TLC series. Tammy's sisters, Amanda Slayton and Misty Slayton, arrived to pick up some things that Tammy wanted and discovered the home had been completely ransacked. Girl, all of her stuff is gone, Amanda announces over the phone in a sneak peek video clip. She continued describing the scene, saying, The fridge was over here, the table was here, the kitchen sink's gone, the bathroom sink, the water heater's missing. Her dresser that was in here was gone with the rest of the clothes and stuff that was in it. Wah! Again. <coughs> Tammy was unavailable for comment because she was too fat. Suppose we told you there's a million dollars on the move and over 50,000 winners will split it. Would that stir you, Stanley? What if we said you could win $250,000 cash? Or if you enter fast, would that get your juices flowing, Stan? Well, the million dollar Reader's Digest sweepstakes is rolling. Over 50,000 prizes, grand prize a quarter of a million. While you sleep, Stan, other people's dreams come true. Watch your mailbox. You can't win if you don't enter. Here is a UFO story by Sheila Padmore. Thanks, Sheila. You may be interested in an experience I had some years ago involving what I am sure must have been a UFO. My husband and I were traveling home in the early hours of the morning in a car driven by my cousin. I was sitting in the front passenger seat when my cousin pointed out a very bright light descending vertically on his side of the car. We thought at first that it was a falling star, but when it suddenly stopped and with a burst of red flames shot across in front of the car to my side, stopped for a while and then dropped vertically again, we realized it must be something much stranger. As the car picked up speed again, we noticed that the object was traveling with us and I wound down the window to make sure it was not a reflection. We noticed that there was no sound from it, which ruled out the possibility that it was a helicopter or an aircraft. As we traveled along, we noticed that the object was following our every movement. When we stopped at traffic lights, it stopped with us. When we slowed down, it did too. Several times we tried to lose it by turning quickly into small side streets but whenever we came out it would be waiting for us on the main road so in the end we stopped trying when we arrived at our house my husband and I got out of the car 
and saw that the object was stationary overhead. By this time, I was feeling just a little nervous, and it was with great relief when my cousin drove off. I saw the object move off again, following the car as before. When he got home, his house was only a short distance away. My cousin telephoned to say the object was stationary above his house. My husband and I went into our backyard and, looking in the direction of my cousin's house, could see the object just hanging there in the sky. By this time, I was quite frightened and went inside. My husband kept popping outside, and half an hour later the object was still there. In the end, we went to bed, as did my cousin and his wife so we can't say how long it remained there. In the morning, I contacted our local newspaper, wondering if someone else might have reported seeing something, but they were not at all interested. I was somewhat surprised, therefore, when, about two years later, the same paper printed an account of a woman's experience that was identical to our own. It also took place in the early hours of the morning and in the same district. It is Bolo! And now, for this week's Cryptid Corner, we take a trip to Margate, South Africa, and we're going to hear about Trunko. Little Trunko is the nickname for an animal reportedly sighted in Margate, South Africa on October 25th, 1924, according to an article entitled Fish Like a Polar Bear, published on the December 27th. 1924 edition of London's Daily Mail. The animal was reputedly first seen off the coast battling two killer whales, which fought the unusual creature for three hours. It was a three-hour battle. It used its tail to attack the whales and reportedly lifted itself out of the water by about 20 feet. The creature reputedly washed up on Margate Beach but despite being there for 10 days, no scientist ever investigated the carcass while it was beached. Of course not. So no reliable description has been published. And until September 2010, it was assumed that no photographs of it had ever been published. Some people who had never been identified were reported to have described the animal as possessing snowy white fur, an elephantine trunk, a lobster-like tail, and a carcass devoid of blood. While it was beached, the animal was measured by beachgoers and turned out to be 47 feet in length, 10 feet wide, and 5 feet high, with the trunk's length being 5 feet long, and the diameter about 14 inches, and the tail 10 feet. The trunk was said to be attached directly to the animal's torso, as no head was visible on the carcass. For this feature, the animal was dubbed Trunko by British cryptozoologist Carl Schuker in his 1996 book, The Unexplained. In the March 27, 1925 edition of the Charleroi Mail in Pennsylvania, an article entitled Whales slain by hairy monster reported that whales there were killed by a strange creature which was washed up on a beach, exhausted and fell unconscious, but made its way back into the ocean and swam away after 10 days, never to be seen again. And that's the story of Trunko. Thank you. It is Balloon! When Teddy Roosevelt Explored the Bigfoot Legend by Nick Kolakowski. Thanks, Nick. With the new year upon us, there's no better time to explore how one of our most famous presidents might have drifted into the orbit of one of the most famous beasts. Theodore Roosevelt, who emerged on the American landscape as a symbol of exuberant, some might say maniac, masculinity before tumbling into the presidency as a consequence of his predecessor's assassination, was an active outdoorsman for nearly his entire life. He not only loved hiking, camping, and shooting big animals with high-powered firearms, he loved writing about these experiences. 
His books included The Wilderness Hunter, Hunting Trips of a Ranchman, and Ranch Life, and The Hunting Trail. In The Wilderness Hunter, Roosevelt describes a peculiar incident with a Native American guide while hunting in the Selkirk Mountain Range, which extends through Idaho into eastern Washington. The mall objected strongly to leaving the neighborhood of the lake. He went to the first day's journey willingly enough, but after that it was increasingly difficult to get him along, and he gradually grew sulky. Finally he gave us to understand that he was afraid because up in the high mountains there were little bad Indians who would kill him if they caught him alone, especially at night. At first we thought he was speaking of stray warriors of the Blackfeet tribe, but it turned out that he was not thinking of human beings at all, but of hobgoblins. <laughs> what are you going to do with all these hobgoblins? Um, yeah. Indeed, the night sounds of these great stretches of mountain, woodland, were very weird and strange. I have never before so well understood why the people who live in lonely forest regions are prone to believe in elves, wood sprites, and other beings of an unseen world. Something was lurking out there, but what? It's easy enough to chalk it up as one of those odd night sounds to conventional animal cries, distorted by distances and mountains. Roosevelt was also an experienced outdoorsman. Something clearly spooked him, to the point where he keeps this reminisce relatively short, in contrast to some of his other tales which go on and on and on. In another passage from the same book, Roosevelt describes a conversation with a mountain man, Bowman, who tells a horrifying tale of a creature in the woods. Roosevelt sets the scene. Frontiersmen are not, as a rule, apt to be very superstitious. They lead lives too hard and practical, and have too little imagination in things spiritual and supernatural. I have heard but a few ghost stories while living on the frontier, and those were of a perfectly commonplace and conventional type. But I once listened to a goblin story, which rather impressed me. A grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter named Bowman, born and had passed all his life on the frontier, told the story to me. He must have believed what he said, for he could hardly repress a shudder at certain points of the tale. But he was of German ancestry, and in childhood had doubtless been saturated with all kinds of ghost and goblin lore, so that many fearsome superstitions were latent in his mind. Besides, he knew well the stories told by the Indian medicine men in their winter camps of the snow walkers and the specters, spirits and ghosts and apparitions the formless evil beings that haunt the forest, depths, and dog and waylay, the lonely wanderer, who after nightfall passes through the regions where they lurk. It may be that, when overcome by the horror of the fate that befell his friend, and when oppressed by the awful dread of the unknown, he grew to attribute both at the same time and still more in remembrance weird and elfin traits to what was merely some abnormally wicked and cunning wild beast but whether this was so or not no man can say when the event occurred bowman was still a young man and was trapping with a partner among the mountains dividing the forks of the salmon from the head of the Wisdom River. Not having much luck, he and his partner determined to go up into a particularly wild and lonely pass, through which ran a small stream said to contain many beavers. This pass had an evil reputation, because the year before, a solitary hunter who had wandered into it was slain seamlessly by a wild beast. 
the half-eaten remains being afterward found by some mining prospectors who had passed his camp only the night before. The memory of this event, however, waited very lightly with the two trappers who were as adventurous and hardy as others of their kind. They took their two lean mountain ponies to the foot of the pass where they left them in an open beaver meadow, the rocky timber clad ground being from there onward impracticable for horses. They then struck out on foot through the vast gloomy forest and in about four hours reached a little open glade where they concluded to camp as signs of game were plenty. There was still an hour or two of daylight left and after building a brush lean-to and throwing down and opening their packs they started upstream. The country was very dense and hard to travel through as there was much down timber although here and there the somber woodland was broken by small glades of mountain grass. At dusk they again reached camp. The glade in which it was pitched was not many yards wide. The tall close set pines and firs rising round it like a wall. On one side was a little stream beyond which rose a steep mountain slope covered with the unbroken growth of evergreen forest. They were surprised to find that during their absence something apparently a bear had visited camp and had rummaged about among their things scattering the contents of their packs and in sheer wantonness destroying their lean-to. The footprints of the beast were quite plain but at first they paid no particular heed to them, busying themselves with rebuilding the lean-to, laying out their beds and stores and lighting the fire. While Bowman was making ready supper, it being already dark, his companion began to examine the tracks more closely and soon took a brand from the fire to follow them up where the intruder had walked along a game trail after leaving camp. When the brand flickered out, he returned and took another, repeating his inspection of the footprints very closely. Coming back to the fire, he stood by it a minute or two, peering out into the darkness, and suddenly remarked, Bowman, that bear has been walking on two legs. Bowman laughed at this, but his partner insisted that he was right, and upon again examining the tracks with a torch, they certainly did seem to have been made by but two paws or feet. However, it was too dark to make sure. After discussing whether the footprints could possibly be those of a human being, and coming to the conclusion that they could not be, the two men rolled up in their blankets and went to sleep under the lean-to. At midnight, Bowman was awakened by some noise and sat up in his blankets. As he did so, his nostrils were struck by a strong wild beast odor, and he caught the loom of a great body in the darkness at the mouth of the lean-to. Grasping his rifle, he fired at the vague, threatening shadow, but must have missed, for immediately afterward he heard the smashing of the underwood as this thing, whatever it was, rushed off into the impenetrable blackness of the forest in the night. After this, the two men slept but little, sitting up by the rekindled fire, but they heard nothing more. In the morning they started out to look at the few traps they had set the previous evening and put out new ones. By an unspoken agreement, they kept together all day and returned to camp towards evening. On nearing it, they saw, hardly to their astonishment, that the lean-to had again been torn down. The visitor of the preceding day had returned, and in wanton malice, had tossed about their camp kit and bedding, and destroyed the shanty. The ground was marked up by its tracks, and on leaving the camp, it had gone along the soft earth by the brook. The footprints were as plain as if on snow, and after a careful scrutiny of the trail, it certainly did seem as if, whatever the thing was, it had walked off on but two legs. 
The men, thoroughly uneasy, gathered a great heap of dead logs and kept up a roaring fire throughout the night, one or the other sitting on guard most of the time. About midnight, the thing came down through the forest opposite, across the brook, and stayed there on the hillside for nearly an hour. They could hear the branches crackle as it moved about, and several times it uttered a harsh, grating, long-drawn moan, a very sinister sound. Yet it did not venture near the fire. In the morning, the two trappers, after discussing the strange events of the last 36 hours, decided they would shoulder their packs and leave the valley that afternoon. They were the more ready to do this because in spite of seeing a good deal of game sign, they had caught very little fur. However, it was necessary first to go along the line of the traps and gather them. And this they started out to do. All the morning they kept together, packing up trap after trap, each one empty. On first leaving camp, they had the disagreeable sensation of being followed. In the dense spruce thickets, they occasionally heard a branch snap after they had passed. And now and then, there were slight rustling noises among the small pines to one side of them. At noon, they were back within a couple of miles of camp. In the high, bright sunlight, their fears seemed absurd to the two armed men. Accustomed as they were, through long years of lonely wandering in the wilderness, to face every kind of danger from man, brute, or element, there were still three beaver traps to collect from a little pond in a wide ravine nearby. Bowman volunteered to gather these and bring them in while his companion went ahead to camp and made ready the packs. On reaching the pond, Bowman found three beavers in the traps, one of which had been pulled loose and carried into a beaver house. He took several hours in securing and preparing the beaver, and when he started homewards, he marked, with some uneasiness, how long the sun was getting. As he hurried toward camp, under the tall trees, the silence and desolation of the forest waited on him. His feet made no sound on the pine needles and the slanting sun rays, striking through among the straight trunks, made a gray twilight in which objects at a distance glimmered indistinctly. There was nothing to break the gloomy stillness, which, when there is no breeze, always broods over these somber primeval forests. At last he came to the edge of the little glade, where the camp laid, and shouted as he approached it, but got no answer. The campfire had gone out, though the thin blue smoke was still curling upwards. Near it lay the packs wrapped and arranged. At first Bowman could see nobody, nor did he receive an answer to his call. Stepping forward again, he shouted, and as he did so his eye fell on the body of his friend stretched beside the trunk of a great fallen spruce. Rushing toward it, the horrified trapper found that the body was still warm, but that the neck was broken, while there were four great fang marks in the throat. The footprints of the unknown beast creature, printed deep in the soft soil, told the whole story. The unfortunate man, having finished his packing, had sat down on the spruce log with his face to the fire, and his back to the dense woods. <laughs> I thought his face was actually in the fire. Sorry. To wait for his companion. While thus waiting, his monstrous assailant, which must have been lurking in the woods, waiting for a chance to catch one of the adventurers unprepared, came silently up from behind, walking with long, noiseless steps, and seemingly still on two legs. Evidently unheard, it reached the man and broke his neck by wrenching his head back with its forepaws while it buried its teeth in his throat. It had not eaten the body, but apparently had romped and gambled around it in uncouth, ferocious glee, occasionally rolling over and over it, and had then fled back into the soundless depths of the woods. 
Bowman, utterly unnerved and believing that this creature with which he had to deal was something either half human or half devil. Some great goblin beast abandoned everything but his rifle and struck off at speed down the pass, not halting until he reached the beaver meadows where the hobbled ponies were still grazing. Mounting, he rode onward through the night until beyond reach of pursuit. Roosevelt himself never names the creature, aside of referring to it as a goblin, which was clearly one of his favorite terms for unknown beasties. But contemporary readers will instantly note that it sounds a whole lot like a Bigfoot, aka Sasquatch, aka the hairiest, smelliest, biggest, upright, walking, ape-like creature to ever reportedly stalk the mountains and forests of the Americas. We can imagine Roosevelt's regret at never encountering such a beast face to face. No doubt he would have relished facing off against such an impressive cryptoid. You can picture the future president stalking through the night, the moonlight reflecting off his glasses and his enormous rifle, murmuring bully under his breath as a 400 pound Bigfoot sizes him up from the far side of a clearing. It would have been a battle for the ages. And that's just about all the show for this week. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you again right here next week. God bless you.